Well, good morning. Uh, we're here with uh, Judge Benjamin Lerner of the Court of Common Pleas of the First Judicial District of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Judge Lerner. Thank you for having me. And we're very happy that you're contributing to this project. It's my pleasure. To start at the beginning, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your early background? Sure. I grew up in a family of three boys, um, of whom I was barely the oldest by less than a year. Uh, we grew up in Feltonville, which is a neighborhood in uh, the lower northeast or the or upper north Philadelphia, <laughs> depending on how you're looking at the map. Uh, I went to public school, uh, Central High School, class of uh, to the, to the 209th class. Okay. Um, you're not allowed to speak about Central without mentioning the class, the class. that you graduated from. Okay. Um, and uh, started college at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I was commuting, which was not a very good way to go to college. Right. I graduated, transferred to Brandeis in my junior year, okay. graduated from there, and then came back and uh, uh, went to the University of Pennsylvania Law School. My brother, who had been a year behind me in high school, had caught up by that point, and so uh, I had the pleasure of going all through law school uh, with my brother. Um, Did that work out well? That actually was a wonderful experience. Oh, good. Uh, at least that was a wonderful experience for me, and I surely hope it was for him. Uh, when I graduated, I uh, spent a year clerking for a very wonderful man, a United States District Court judge in San Francisco named Stanley Weigel, who taught me a lot about being a judge okay. long before I ever thought right. that I might ever be a judge. Um, after that, I came back uh, to Philadelphia to participate for two years in a graduate program in criminal law between the University of Pennsylvania Law School yeah. and the Defender Association, which was then a much smaller, uh, less organized organization than it later became and is now. A little before you actually became chief defender. <laughs> yes, several several years before. Maybe planted the seeds, I don't know. Well, it certainly, it certainly um, kind of got the uh, criminal justice system hooks in me, uh -huh. so that uh, I've never been too far away from that during most of my career. I noticed by reading your uh, CV. So, and now that you, you mentioned that program, and and that was a sort of a twofold program with actually trying cases, and also supervising the law students at the time. That's right, uh, Professor Tony Amsterdam, who got a Ford Foundation grant to start this program with the idea of first uh, exposing law students who might never practice in this area mm -hmm. to uh, some idea of what the criminal justice system is really like, especially for indigent defendants, mm -hmm. and also to help out what was then a very small right. defender uh, association mm -hmm. with very few uh, experienced people. Uh, the idea was that the graduate fellows who were recent graduates from law schools around the country would work at the Defender Association part-time. Mm -hmm. It was a two-year program and we would do everything the assistant defenders did in terms of preparing and trying cases, mm -hmm. but we would also supervise the third-year Penn Law students who were as part of their coursework um, working at the Defender Association. Okay. Uh, and with the law students, we would have a chance to do what full-time assistant defenders didn't have time to do, which was to work on um, system reform and impact litigation in addition to doing the case-by-case -case work. Which was very important at that time. I, I think so. There wasn't anybody else doing that work. The organization wasn't large enough as it is now right. to have even a separate appeals division, let alone a separate law reform division. Right. And a lot of the systemic work that the Defender Association has done 
uh, actually had its start with the fellows in that Amsterdam program. There's some very, very well-known uh, Philadelphia lawyers, uh, Dave Rudofsky, Dave Carey's, Lou Natale, who got their start in that program, mm -hmm. and some people on a national level, Don Stern, who became a very well-known United States attorney in Massachusetts, and uh, another judge, Aurelio Munoz, who became the chief uh, criminal court judge for Los Angeles County. Okay. We all got our start in that program. That's great. And what happened in your legal career following that program? Well, after the two years, um, I was hired as an associate at Ballard's Bar in 1968. And I was there till 1970, early 1973 as an mm -hmm. associate. But I was there under really wonderful, unique circumstances. Oh. At that time, law firms were recruiting law students who would come of age in the 60s, late 60s, and early 70s. And the first question a lot of those law students asked, yeah. even the biggest firms, yeah. was not how much are you going to pay me, but rather what opportunity will I have to do some public service or pro bono work. So Ballard, knowing that I had had these two years yeah. as a criminal defense lawyer what do you know? gave me a excessive free hand <laughs> to do a lot of um, not only criminal defense work but general civil liberties and public interest work and there was a lot of that in those days there was all the um, Vietnam era okay, um, yeah. litigation around the surrounding uh, conscientious objectors mm -hmm. in the draft and war protesters. Uh, there were national grand jury, um, Justice Department grand jury investigations of uh, people like the Berrigans and their associates. Oh, right. yeah. And Ballard allowed me to get involved in that. Probably after a few years had passed and I wasn't making any money for them. Uh, probably they wondered if they had given me too free a hand. And probably they did. And when they suggested that, uh, by that time I was really hooked, I think, on both public service and criminal defense work. And I had an opportunity to join the um, uh, SHAP administration in Harrisburg. At that time, the Attorney General was not an independently elected official. Uh, um, oh. The Attorney General was a member of the Governor's Cabinet, okay. and the Attorney General, um, uh, Israel Packle, whose son and nephew I had worked with at the Defender Association, uh, offered me a job as uh, Chief of the Justice Department, State Justice Department's Office of Criminal Law, wow. uh, which gave me an opportunity to do administrative work, yeah. advisory work, and also to be on the prosecution side, because at that time right, yeah. we were chief counsel for the state police, mm -hmm. uh, chief counsel for the Department of Corrections and the Board of Probation and Parole, and we also served as a resource for a lot of part-time DAs in the smaller counties. Uh, I did that work for about two years. The chief defender position came open and I applied for that and uh, I was lucky enough to be selected um, in late 1974. Uh, and you were there for and quite some time. I was there time. for 15 years yeah. from 1975 through the middle of 1990. But combining your service to the poor, criminal, uh, both defense and prosecution, and the organization uh, experience that you got from working at the uh, uh, Attorney General's office and elsewhere, it seemed like a perfect fit for you to uh, jump into that Chief Defender's uh, position. Well, I thought it was a perfect fit. I didn't know whether the board search committee would think <laughs> it was a perfect fit. Um, and uh, I'm not sure. In fact, I am sure. I wasn't their first choice, but I like to think we were both equally satisfied you were the best with the way choice. that turned out. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I'm sure they were too. And after your work at 
at the Defender Association, which was quite extensive, as we said, for 15 or 16 years. Then what happened? Uh, well, I left the Defender Association, uh, frankly, because I thought I had been there long enough mm -hmm. so that I was maybe getting a little, a little stale. Uh -huh. um, but also for financial reasons. Uh, my ex-wife had been working as a partner in a major Philadelphia law firm. Uh -huh. uh, she had decided to retire from the practice to uh -huh. raise our son, who was about three years old at that time. Uh, and so I started to look for uh, something else, mm -hmm. and I uh, resigned and, from the defender position and went into private practice uh, and ultimately wound up with the uh, Dilworth Paxson Law Firm, okay. which was just a great place for me to be, no uh, a tremendous opportunity. Um, the people who ran that firm, Bruce Kaufman, uh, Steve Harmel, and Joe Giacovini, gave me a great opportunity to come and sharpen my litigation skills right. and um, also to, um, to broaden my practice. Yeah. I had done some civil litigation while I'd been at Ballard, yeah. but obviously I hadn't done any in the 17 <laughs> years right. before I went to Dilworth. So uh, they gave me an opportunity to do a lot of work at a time when most firms would not hire you at the level I came in at unless you had a book of business to bring. Right. Okay. Well, obviously, I didn't have a book of business <laughs> no. to bring. But they gave me an opportunity there. And uh, by that time, I had really started to think seriously about my interest in becoming a judge. Great. Um, and the one thing that, uh, the, one of the f essential things that Dilworth provided, they're a politically connected firm mm -hmm. on both sides of the aisle. Right. And obviously while I was at the Defender's Office, I hadn't had a chance to um, build up that portfolio of um, politically active work. I'd, right. I'd done a lot of public service work, obviously, um, but um, with Dilworth, I also got the opportunity uh, to do work on cases that were of interest to the people who oh. were influential okay. in uh, making judges. Right. And uh, fortunately, also, um, Tom Ridge, when he was governor, had hired Paul Tofano from the Blank Firm mm -hmm. uh, as his general counsel. And I knew Paul through my ex-wife and also because while I was at the Defender Association, we had been involved in helping Blank Rome set up a project which you probably remember okay. from your days in family court. <laughs> they, did a, uh, they wanted to do a pro bono project providing representation in juvenile court right. to uh, juveniles who couldn't afford counsel. And our office cooperated with that effort okay. and provided them with some training and a little bit of supervision. And so when I approached Paul and his deputy, Bill Chadwick, right. who had been Ron Castile's first assistant uh -huh. uh, when Ron was the DA and right. I was the chief defender, they brought my interest to their boss in a very favorable, strong way. Good. Uh, and uh, fortunately for me, uh, um, the uh, uh, Democratic City Committee and um, uh, Governor Ridge yeah. uh, were putting, the, and Senator Frank Salvatore, were putting together a uh, appointment package for Philadelphia judges okay. in 19, late 19, 95 and early 1996, and Governor Ridge insisted that I be part of that package. Well, that's great. It was great. It yeah. was uh, it was a tremendous boost for me, sure. and I was appointed in 1996 and sworn in on June 6, 1996. Congratulations. Well, thank you. And we we're happy but, that you're here. <laughs> but, but the story didn't end there, right. because as you know. 
when you're appointed, you've got to run in the next election, sure and you have to win the Democratic primary in order to stay on the bench. Right. Well, I had learned a lot about the appointment process, but obviously I hadn't learned anything about, about the election, election process. process. Because even though I was endorsed by the city committee in the 97 primary, I was one of four out of seven endorsed Common Pleas candidates who lost the primary that oh, year. Oh, okay. So obviously losing the primary meant you were not going to win the general election. Exactly. And so my first term ended very quickly, yeah. the end of 1997. But Governor Ridge had let me know that um, he would make sure I got another chance, okay. that he was going to reappoint me. Good. The party didn't object to that, mm -hmm. but as the governor said to me, listen, I can reappoint you, but I can't help you in these Democratic primary elections. Right. That's something you're going to have to learn how to do yourself. Okay. Unfortunately, by 1999, I managed learned. to learn how to do okay. it. <laughs> so then I went back on the bench. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I got reappointed in 98, uh, yes. and I was back on the bench uh, in the spring of 1998, but this time I was able to stay. Good. Excellent. And we're happy about that. Well, thank you. <laughs> Not as happy as I am, probably. <laughs> Now, I know that, uh, was there a, a, a lot leading up to your current position in uh, homicide as the calendar judge? or what, what kind of judge work have you been doing? Well, when I started as a judge, I started in one of the two places that new judges start, mm -hmm. in the felony waiver program. Okay. And then I moved up, when I got reappointed, uh, I'd already been doing felony waivers at that point for a year and a half or so, mm -hmm. and I got moved up to major trials. Um, the court, uh, Judge Herron was in his first term as administrative judge right. then, and the court was, gonna, was trying an experiment, uh, a team approach in the, the Criminal Justice Center, um, and some of the teams would be combined major trial and homicide cases. Yeah. And Judge Heron asked me to be the head of one of the teams, uh, which I was happy to do. And that was a combination of trial work uh -huh. and administrative right. work, pre-trial, getting some cases ready to be tried by other judges, and you also had your own uh, trial list. Yeah. The team approach didn't work out very well. Uh, the, neither the DA's office nor the defense bar liked the idea of not having a dedicated homicide calendar room. Okay. Uh, and so after a year or so of that, yeah. um, we went back to the calendar room system for homicide cases, and Judge Heron asked me to be the calendar judge. Um, I have to tell you, I was a little apprehensive about yeah. doing that, because while yeah. I was at the defender's office, we weren't handling homicide cases. Right. Uh, certainly not on a regular basis. We had one or two, mm -hmm. and I had had a few homicide cases in uh, private practice, oh. but I did not think, and I was right in this, yeah. that I was in any way an expert in homicide, uh, in, the, in the homicide law yeah. or the homicide program. But Judge Herman told me that um, if I kept my mouth shut more than I'm likely to do, and if I actually paid attention to some of the more experienced lawyers in the defense bar, the Defender Association, uh -huh. and the DA's office, they would teach me what I needed to know. Uh, okay. And I think they have. Yeah. Because I've been doing this assignment since, um, ooh, 2001. Yeah, okay. So it's been some time. It's now. been some time now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now that, that okay. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> mm -hmm. The other part of my assignment, which is less well-known and less public, but at least as important, yeah. is the direct file decertification oh, calendar. Right. And that is something that I know you're familiar yes. with. Um, when the district attorney wants to try a juvenile defendant in adult court under the uh, direct file statute, the defendant has an opportunity to file a motion called a decertification motion to try to 
gets sent back to juvenile, juvenile court. Yeah. And I started doing that calendar when I started doing the homicide calendar in 2001. So I've done almost all of the decertification uh, okay. hearings. And they're very important decisions, they as are you said. Yeah. Incredibly important in the lives of these juveniles who's, you learn a, a, a lot about their background. The hearing sure. is more, is not only about the facts or the allegations uh, in the cases in which they're charged, but it's also about their backgrounds their and lives. whether they are amenable to rehabilitation yeah. in the juvenile system uh, in the time remaining in the system. And so you really learn everything about uh, these young people's backgrounds right. from really their birth. Yeah, uh, sure. And it's, it's just, you know from your experience that there are a lot of kids in this city who are really never given a chance. Right. And not never given a chance by the system. It's not the system's fault frequently, it's the fact that they don't have any parenting. No, from the beginning. Uh, from the beginning. Right. They're raised on the streets. And you see that. In yeah. every one of these cases you see everything that can be done to destroy a child exactly. from birth, yeah. but you also see, unfortunately, everything that children raised like that are capable of doing to other people. Yeah. And then you have to draw the, bow, uh, draw the line about which ones ought to have another shot at juvenile court right. and which ones don't. As a former juvenile probation officer, I experienced some of those cases uh, firsthand, and you're right, it's, I mean, I can't imagine the balancing act that you have to go through in order to properly decide those decertification Well, petitions. I would say even, even including the homicide work yeah. and some very diff difficult homicide trials and sentencings, on the whole, the direct file decertification work is the hardest thing I've ever had to do as a judge. Okay. And maybe the most important. Okay. I agree with you. Now, uh, you mentioned before about the uh, uh, practice of law and how recent graduates at, a, at the, the time were interested in public service and pro bono work. Um, how do you think the practice of law has changed to today? Well, I think it's changed At least several in. times oh, okay. uh, depending on the economic situation. Um, right now, I think most people coming out of law school just want to get a job. Right. Uh, people come out of really good law schools with good records and uh, as our judicial fellowship program demonstrates, a lot of them simply can't find a job right. for a while. Yeah. So no matter what their interest is in public service, they've got to put self-preservation first. Mm. Also, when I was graduating law school, people were not coming out with these huge student loan debts. All right. And if you come out of school and you owe $50,000 or $60,000, you have to think about how you're going to pay that back. Exactly. Um, I will say this, that I think that in the last 10 years or so, uh, maybe even a little longer, law schools have gotten a lot more sensitive about these problems. And they're doing what they can in terms of clinical programs and internships to encourage students in, uh, uh, in public service work. My alma mater, Penn, is a good example of that, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Now, uh, how about your, your, uh, your experience uh, during your whole life, your experience with the law? Were there any particular individuals to whom you looked up to and tried to maybe emulate, or at least to who you, whom you admired? Well, I had no experience to speak of with lawyers um, before I went to law school. Uh, there were no lawyers in my family, and in oh. fact, my brothers and I were the first 
uh, we, we went to college, and that was unusual yeah. in our family. Same with me. Um, but in, at Penn, which was a relatively small school, you could get to know the professors really well. Mm -hmm. And my first real experience um, was with a handful of professors at Penn. Uh, Tony Amsterdam, I've already mentioned. Right. Paul Bender, who got me this clerkship with uh, Judge Weigel, okay. uh, which was so important right. uh, to me. Um, uh, Howard Lesnick, who just recently retired. These were all really brilliant professors who were, well, I would say they were instrumental in um, in giving us the idea yeah. that public service work was as valuable and as important for a lawyer as anything else that you could do. Uh -huh. And I think that uh, it's no accident that both my brother and I uh, were directed toward public service work, even though he had a long career in private practice, mm -hmm. and I had a couple of uh, shorter uh, sessions Experience. in private okay. practice. Um, so that was where that that was the first influence. Yeah. Um, the judge that I clerked for, who I've mentioned a couple times already, Judge Weigel, was a tremendous influence on me. He was a old-fashioned California Republican. Uh, appointee. Uh, he, uh, although he had been appointed by President Kennedy, uh, he was uh, conservative in a lot of uh, uh, economic ways, mm -hmm. but he was socially very progressive. And even though in his background um, he had never practiced uh, in a way where he did much work for um, indigent defendants or mm -hmm. indigent uh, civil clients, he instinctively knew that the um, less resources yeah. a litigant had, the more care the judge had to take of that litigant. Very good. And he knew it because that was the kind of person mm -hmm. he was. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most significant thing that I learned from him. Yeah. And I hope that that's characterized my career, both pre-judicial and judicial. Right, well, and it seems to be, from how you've described your, your current duties, especially. I hope so. Yeah. Also, when I started practicing at the Defender's Office, uh, there were some real legends on the bench, okay. both in Philadelphia in our common pleas court yeah. and in the uh, federal courts here. Uh, uh, Judge uh, uh, Donald Jam Jameson, who was right. the first uh, president judge that I worked with, and then Judge Bradley, whose career as president judge uh, kind of coincided with my tenure at the Defender Association. Okay. Uh -huh. um, judge Greenberg, Judge Levin, and Clifford Scott Green, who is just one of the most wonderful judges um, and human beings that anybody could ever hope to uh, uh, hope to meet. And I started off, actually, my first experience with Judge Green was in family court, uh -huh. representing defender clients in the late 60s uh, over at 1801 Vine. Right. And then later on, uh, I had uh, the uh, good fortune of being before him representing the state police, the Pennsylvania State Police, in a landmark employment discrimination case okay. in federal court. Uh, judge Green was the judge who was in charge of that case, and that case led to a settlement which um, not only led to the first African American uh, state police commissioner, and the yeah. only one so far uh -huh. we've ever had, but really opened up the um, state police ranks right. to minorities. Um, and I 
think Judge Green's stewardship of the case yeah. had a lot to do with that. My brother clerked for Judge Leon Higginbotham, and okay. I got to know Judge Higginbotham mm -hmm. uh, through him. And all you have to do is mention his name. Another and, great name. <laughs> that's right. Uh, judge uh, Joe Lord was the chief judge on the uh, Eastern District when I was uh, uh, when I was uh, the, at the Defender's Office, and before that when I was uh, at the Attorney General's Office. And you couldn't practice in front of him without learning a lot. Um, later on, uh, I became uh, uh, I, I became friendly with. Uh, Another generation of judges, yeah. uh, uh, Judge Lawrence Prattis, uh -huh. um, okay. uh, uh, Judge. Uh, I'm trying. To, I can't even. I can't even think of all of them. Right. Uh, there were so many. Um, but. Uh, Needless to say, you've paid attention to an awful lot of people who are well known in the law. And whom you knew personally, also. Yeah, I had a tremendous opportunity to be exposed to uh, tr uh, a lot of really great uh, mentors, mm -hmm. both on the bench mm -hmm. and in practice. Um, and I know this is kind of a this is kind of a cliche, yeah. uh, but I think it's a cliche. For the reason most cliches are cliches, and that is because there's a lot of truth to it. <laughs> yes. When I began practicing, um, even the first time that I was in private practice at Ballard, um, law was a real profession. Sure, people wanted to make a living, and a good living, yeah. and a lot of people made an extraordinarily good living about it. Right. But the emphasis was within the firm, on hiring people who you thought were going to be with you forever. All right. Uh, not just working for you, but really becoming your colleagues, your partners, right. your friends. And that's the way teaching and mentoring was done within the law firm. And as far as the practice was concerned, the idea was um, that if you could represent clients over a long period of time, and you could understand their business, their lives, their needs, yeah. you would be more than a hired gun in an emergency situation. Right. You would be a lifetime counselor. Exactly. Very good. Uh, well, obviously, that changed a lot. <laughs> and it has changed a lot. And I was fortunate to miss most of the change. <laughs> because I was back at the Defender's Office, yeah. running that office, and then I was in the Attorney General's Office uh, <laughs> before that. So uh, during that period of almost 20 years, I was not in private practice. On the other hand, I had a lot of friends who were in private practice, and okay. most of the members of the Defender Board were um, leading lawyers mm -hmm. uh, in their uh, in, in the the profession here, right. but I, even listening to them, I guess I didn't have that much of an idea about how much things had changed okay. until I left the Defender office and uh, went back into private practice myself. And found out when you heard them. I found out I was, uh, I was made for public service, <laughs> I think. That's what I found out. <laughs> Well, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I know you have a number of appointments and awards. And well, they are, they are what they are. I got a, a tremendous opportunity at the Defender Office not only to be involved in local bar association, and bar association activities on the Board of Governors and on the uh, Judicial the Bar Association's Judicial Committee uh, back when we were really kind of setting it up right. and getting it going, but um, through the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, on whose board I served and uh, for whom I served as president right. for a couple of years, uh, I got an opportunity to work with the American Bar Association and to do a lot of work uh, in different parts of the country mm -hmm. on uh, 
um, criminal justice issues, okay. particularly the providing of defense services. Uh, and I think I learned a lot more than I ever taught okay. from those experiences. Yeah. Um, I've been very lucky in my career. Uh -huh. I've gotten a couple of great, great opportunities, yeah. and uh, I'm happy to be still serving as a senior judge. Right. Uh, the fact that I'm allowed to continue to have the same assignment that I had for so many years uh, is uh, it's a real blessing wow. for me. And I just, uh, uh, you know a lot of people, uh, we all know a lot of people for whom work is just the thing they have to do yeah. to make a living. Bye. And I know how lucky I am to be one of those people who for most of my career has been able to say, I can't think of anything I'd rather do when I get up this morning than go and do this job. That's great. And we're very fortunate at the court system to have you. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks again. Thank Judge you very Benjamin much. Lerner.